Hello, welcome to this lesson on particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter. We'll start by looking at the electron and at a particle called the positron, which you'll learn is the antiparticle of an electron. We'll talk about a process called annihilation and a process called perproduction. Then we'll be able to explain more clearly what we mean by particles and antiparticles, and matter and antimatter. There are no calculations in this lesson, it's very fact-based. So let's talk about electrons to start with. You probably already know a bit about the electron. Symbol is usually E, or E with a minus sign. If the electron is produced during beta minus decay, radioactive decay, it's referred to as a beta particle and is given the symbol beta or beta minus. Mass is 9.11, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Charge is minus 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. In relative units, that's minus 1. The electron is a member of a family of particles called leptons. If you haven't heard of leptons, it doesn't matter too much, but the electron has a property called lepton number, and the value is 1. Actually, that's an oversimplification. There are three types of lepton number, but let's keep it simple. The electron has a lepton number of 1. So there's some basic facts about the electron. Let's talk about this other particle, which is an elementary particle like the electron. It's called the positron. Symbol is E with a plus sign. There is a type of radioactive decay. It's not as common as ordinary beta minus decay, but it's called beta plus decay. And rather than electrons being emitted from the nuclei, positrons are emitted from nuclei. And they're referred to as beta plus particles symbol beta plus. What about the mass of one of these positrons? It's the same as the mass of an electron. Charge? It's the opposite. It's plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, or plus 1 in relative units. And it's a member of the lepton family, and it's got a lepton number of minus 1. So if we compare the electron to the positron, they're rather similar. They've got the same mass, but some other properties are reversed. And the positron is called the antiparticle of the electron. In a sense, it's the opposite of the electron. And it's not just these numbers that make the positron the antiparticle of the electron. There's something else as well. So let's talk about annihilation, and you'll see what I mean. Let's suppose an electron is moving to the right, as shown by the arrow, and it meets a positron moving to the left. What happens when they meet? This. Did you see what happened? The electron and positron are gone. In their place, we've got two gamma photons, two high-energy photons. Let me show you that again. There's the electron meeting the positron, they disappear. They're destroyed. All that's left are two gamma photons. And we say the electron and positron annihilate. And the process is called annihilation. The electron and positron have basically destroyed each other. It's not total destruction. There is something left over. Basically, what's happened is their mass has turned into energy in the form of two gamma photons. So here we've got an example of a particle and its corresponding antiparticle, electron and positron. They annihilate, they turn to energy. And that's a characteristic of a particle and its antiparticle. They can annihilate and turn to energy, two photons. We can write the equation for this process. Electron plus positron becomes two gamma photons. In talks, you'll probably see a diagram looking something like that. They'll show you the electron and positron before, and the gamma photons after, all on the same diagram. That's a very important process, which helps us understand the nature of particles and antiparticles. When they meet, they 
in, a, in essence cancel each other out and turn into energy. There is an opposite process to annihilation and it's called perp reduction. Let me give you an explanation of what perp reduction is. Here's a nucleus and supposing a gamma photon with a high energy comes along passes near the nucleus this can happen. Did you see what happened? The gamma photon is gone. It has actually turned into a pair of particles. A particle plus antiparticle. Electron plus positron. This process is called pair production because it produces a particle-antiparticle pair. Let me do it again for you. There's a photon happily moving along, passes near a nucleus, and the electron and positron are created and the photon disappears. In this case energy has turned into a particle and an antiparticle. We've converted energy to mass. The equation would be gamma becomes electron plus positron. So a gamma photon turns into a particle-antiparticle pair in this process of pair production. It can't happen for any old photon. The photon's got to have enough energy. And in this case, the photon must have a minimum energy of 2 m subscript e c squared. m subscript e means the mass of an electron. If you remember e equals m c squared, you will know the electron consists of an amount of energy equal to its mass times c squared. So does the positron. It's got the same mass as the electron. That means the total amount of energy needed to create an electron and positron is 2 mec squared. So the photon that came along must have had at least that amount of photon energy. If it had less than that amount of photon energy, then this couldn't happen. If it has more than that amount of photon energy, the extra energy can be carried away as kinetic energy by the electron and by the positron, and also a little bit by the nucleus. Students usually ask at this point, well, what on earth is the purpose of the nucleus? What is it doing? All I'll say at the moment is you've got to have the nucleus to conserve momentum. Now, if that doesn't satisfy you, you can have a more detailed explanation, but it's a bit technical, and I've put it at the very end of the video for anyone who's interested. So if you want a bit more detail about what this nucleus is doing, it's at the end of the video. In your textbook, you probably see a diagram looking like that, the gamma photon before and the electron positrons after near a nucleus. That would be a typical diagram showing per production. Let's talk about a couple of other examples of particles and antiparticles. We've talked about the electron and the positron. What about the proton? What do we know about the proton? I put a few facts there. Symbol, mass, charge. It's a member of a family of particles called baryons. And we say the proton has a baryon number of one. Again, if you're not familiar with baryons and baryon numbers, it doesn't matter. It's just another property of a proton. What about the antiproton? It exists. The symbol we use is P with a line over the top, P with a bar, and we pronounce that P bar. If you would like to pause the video, you might want to guess what the mass, charge, and baryon number of an antiproton are. Pause now and have a go. Well, I hope you tried it. The mass is just the same as the mass of a proton. The charge is opposite, it's negative, and the baryon is minus one. So the antiproton is in a sense the opposite of a proton. If a proton and antiproton meet, they will annihilate. If you have enough energy, you can create a proton and antiproton pair. Another quick example, there's some data about the neutron. What do you think the table for the antineutron would look like. Pause and just think about that for a moment. Let me go through it. The symbol is n bar. The mass is the same. The charge, well you can't negate zero. You still get zero. So that's unchanged. But the baryon number will be minus one. So that's some information about an antineutron. And again, if a neutron meets an antineutron, they annihilate. 
If you've got enough energy, you could create a neutron, an anti-neutron pair. So, we can summarize some of the things we've learned and explain what we mean by particles and antiparticles. So, what can we say about a particle and its antiparticle? Well, they have the same mass, they have opposite charge, if they're charged, they have opposite particle family numbers, like lepton number and baryon number, they annihilate, if they meet, to produce two photons, and they can be created as a pair, which is a process of pair production. So that's some characteristics of a particle and antiparticle. And for every type of particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle. But there are some special cases you should be aware of. However, there are some special cases. The photon, something called a graviton. I don't know if you can hear that. A plane is passing overhead. I'll let it go by. We're looking at the, some special cases. The photon, the graviton, a particle called a Z particle, and a particle called a neutral pion, pi zero. These are rather unusual. They are their own antiparticles. When you reverse the properties, you get the same particle back. They don't annihilate themselves if two of them meet, but they are regarded as their own antiparticles. And the important one for you at this stage is the photon. So the photon and an antiphoton are one and the same thing. We say the photon is its own antiparticle. So, a couple of words about symbols we use. It depends. The symbol, if the symbol for a particle includes the charge sign, the plus or minus, then the antiparticle symbol has simply got the sign reverse. So E minus is an electron. We reverse the sign and write E plus for a positron. We don't put E bar. It's convention for a positron to write it as E plus. Particles such as a muon, the normal particle is a mu minus. The antiparticle of a muon and antimuon is written as mu plus. If the symbol for a particle doesn't include the charge, we put a bar over the top. That's what we saw for proton and antiproton, neutron and antineutron. And we can talk about matter and antimatter now. A normal matter is a material made of normal particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's what you're made of, what the computer's made of, what the Earth is made of, normal matter. And it's the most common form of matter. Antimatter refers to anything made of antiparticles, or usually just the antiparticles themselves. We refer to antiprotons as being antimatter, or antineutrons as being antimatter, or positrons as being antimatter. We don't normally deal with lumps of antimatter. It's very difficult even to make an atom of antimatter. So antimatter is just antiparticles. It's very uncommon. The universe appears to be made almost entirely from normal matter with very little antimatter around. No one is quite sure why. Physicists believe that the universe was created at the moment of the Big Bang that initially there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And for some reason, for some reason due to asymmetry in the laws of physics, the amount of antimatter has reduced, leaving a universe full of ordinary matter. And no one really understands what's happened and why this is so. It's worth being aware of the fact that if you could have a piece of matter and a piece of antimatter, like a, a pebble made of matter and a pebble made of antimatter, if they came into contact you would have a huge explosion. There would be a huge release of gamma radiation which would heat the material around it, a vast explosion if you had a significant size piece of matter meet a significant size piece of antimatter. A couple of interesting facts, actually three interesting facts about matter and antimatter. We can make antiparticles 
in particle accelerators. That's one of the things we use particle accelerators for. And here's an example reaction which creates antimatter. It looks a bit peculiar, but that's OK. Proton plus proton meet in a head-on collision, so they're carrying a lot of kinetic energy. One of the many possibilities is what comes out is this. Two protons and a pair, a proton plus antiproton created at the same time. We've used the kinetic energy of the colliding particles to create mass, to create, in this case, a particle and antiparticle. It's one way to make um, antimatter. Particle accelerator collisions. Interesting fact one. Interesting fact two. Positronium is an interesting name. It's the name of an atom consisting of an electron and positron in orbit around their center of mass. So they're orbiting the center point. It's not really an atom in the normal sense. It hasn't got a nucleus in the middle. It's an electron and a positron orbiting each other called positronium. And it's very unstable. After a very short time, these particles will annihilate. It's got a very short half-life. Antihydrogen is what we would call an atom made from a positron in orbit around an antiproton. It's the reverse of hydrogen. We replace a proton with an antiproton and the electron with the positron and we've made antihydrogen. And tiny amounts have been made. Very difficult to make, very difficult to store, of course, because as soon as it meets normal matter, it will annihilate. And we are done. Thank you for watching. But there is a bonus video, bonus slide, I should say, if you are interested. Earlier on, we talked about per production, and the question is what does a nucleus do? Why is the nucleus needed for per production? I'm going to explain that if you're interested, otherwise you can stop the video. But if you are interested, you will have to have some technical knowledge, and I'm assuming that you know the following, that the that momentum must be conserved, and what we mean by the law of conservation of momentum, what a center of mass frame of reference is, and that a momentum carries, sorry, that a photon carries momentum. Even though the photon's got no mass, it still has got some momentum. So if you're already familiar with those three topics, you will understand what I'm going to tell you. Let's talk about power production and the role of the nucleus. To start with, we've got to imagine being in the center of mass frame of reference of the electron-positron pair that's produced. Now, if you're in the right center of mass frame of reference, that means you're moving along at, the, at a speed which makes the electron and positron appear to move in exactly opposite directions with exactly the same speed from your point of view. The electron moves upwards on my diagram, the positron moves downwards, and they have the same speed and therefore the same momentum, same magnitude of momentum. And the total momentum of these two is zero, because one has got momentum up, the other has got momentum down. The total momentum of these is zero, as seen in the center of mass frame of reference. But just before per production occurred, the incoming photon had momentum p. It was moving let's say, to the right, and had momentum directed to the right, momentum P. So the question is, what's happened to that momentum? If the momentum of the electron and positron after the pair production is zero, what happened to the momentum of the gamma photon? You must conserve momentum. So to conserve momentum, after the per production process occurred, something must have a moment, still have a momentum of P, the momentum equal to the gamma photon's momentum. And that's the role of the nucleus. The nucleus gets pushed forward slightly, given momentum in the same direction as the gamma photon. So overall, momentum is conserved. And a nucleus is able to do this because it's positively charged and can experience a force exerted by the electric field in the gamma photon. Well, I hope you understood that. That's what the nucleus does in per production. Thank you, and bye-bye.